Welcome to the event for Sewn in Memory, AIDS Quilt Panels of Central Illinois, featuring a great discussion by Jerry Cardin, Mike Benner, and Julie Pride. My name is Beth Watkins. I'm part of the Spurlock staff, and I had the extreme honor of being the coordinator for the exhibit that we're going to be talking about today. I would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution for the last 150 plus years. We are also obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the role that this university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement and the centering of Native peoples is a start as we move forward. Please help us hold the Spurlock Museum accountable to these principles. Before we get into the content of today's event, um, it is with great sadness that I note the passing of Professor Catherine Overdeck, who meant a great deal to me professionally and personally, so I hope you'll bear with me if I get a little weepy as I speak about her for a few moments. There's going to be a lot of weeping today, I think. <laughs> as a faculty person in the UIUC Department of History, Kathy had a long career of teaching undergraduate and graduate students in U.S., Illinois, cultural, labor, and public history. Uh, for those of you like me who weren't exactly sure what public history means, let me share with you um, a definition. It's applying history outside academia. So that's to all of us sitting here in a museum, um, thinking about things that have happened and how they impact today. Public historians may be consultants, museum professionals, government historians, archivists, oral historians, you will see some of their work today, cultural resource managers, curators, film and media producers, historical interpreters, historic preservationists, policy advisors, local historians like Jerry, and community activists like everyone who's going to be speaking to you today. Kathy supervised public history student interns for course credit, and she created a network of professionals interested in public history work, connecting faculty with staff of local museums and archives. She led a course called History Harvest, Collaborative Public Digital History, in which students engage with members of the public to collect and digitize documents and artifacts of historical interest for scholarly and community research. History Harvest research areas have included LGBTQIA activism, the Fifth and Hill Neighborhood Rights Campaign in Champaign, and the Independent Media Center in Urbana, all things that I know this audience knows and cares about. Kathy was honored with the Distinguished Award for Campus Excellence in Public Engagement just last year. It is her work with History Harvest that led to Sewn in Memory and the exhibit and collaboration. This project brought together the Greater Community AIDS Project of East Central Illinois, Spurlock Museum, Illinois Public Media, and faculty and students from the Departments of Journalism as well as History. The genesis and guiding spirit of this project are Kathy's. I had the opportunity to share the resulting exhibit with the head of the Smithsonian last month when he came to campus. When he came to campus um, to be awarded an honorary doctorate at commencement. I probably don't need to explain that the head of the Smithsonian is as important in the museum field as you can get, and Lonnie Bunch is an extraordinary historian, museum professional, and human being. I highly recommend kind of looking at some of his talks on YouTube or things like that if you're interested in uh, kind of museums and public history and, and what it means to engage with memory and knowledge in the United States right now. Um, that is an experience I will never forget. He was profoundly moved and impressed by the project and said, this is the kind of thing museums should do. Um, and that comes entirely from seeds that Kathy planted and nourished. Speaking of seeds, several of Kathy's students have also been an important team member at the museum. They include current undergraduate Anna Rataj, I don't know if she's here today, um, who was part of History Harvest for both semesters and worked extensively on sewn in memory, things like painting, nailing, screwing things into the wall, Anna did that, as well as research. 
And Dr. Nathan Tai, who was the curator of the exhibit, Debates, Decisions, Demands, Objects of Political Campaigns and Activism that we did last academic year, and also developed public programming to go with previous um, Spurlock exhibits that focused on university history. As you can tell from this list, which is by no means exhaustive, Kathy was a historian who deeply valued living people. Her emphasis on connecting stories from the past with current events and issues experienced by people here and now will endure in projects across this campus, in our communities, and at the museum. Thank you. And I now turn it over to Jerry Carden. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Beth. And one of the side benefits of this project was getting to meet so many wonderful people from here at the university and across the community that have become good friends. Uh, Kathy included, and uh, Beth especially also. And early in November, on the first slide, you notice the dates for the actual exhibit. It opened on November 2nd. And we were so pleased when we found out that Spurlock was going to give us until July 10th to have this exhibit up. And so it gave us time for plenty of programming. And uh, on the opening night, we invited the collaborators for the project in. And this picture happened to capture some of us, uh, Mike Benner, of course, and Kathy. We wanted to be sure and include this picture because it had Kathy in it. Kimberly Cronick, who I know many of you um, know, is an amazing um, historian as well as educator. She works for WILL slash Illinois Public Media, another one of our favorite uh, organizations in this community, one of the best reasons to live here, and of course, yours truly, and Beth. So we, we were so sad to learn about Kathy's death. and. <coughs> She told me, I don't believe it was the first semester we were working together, that she was having some health issues, which she didn't tell me exactly why. And it was in the second semester that we were working together, which was still pretty pandemic related. And we were doing a hybrid uh, class for History Harvest, where some of the students were meeting on Zoom, some were actually going into one of the uh, uh, classrooms where they were doing the actual uh, scanning, digitization, and uh, meeting with people to go through the documents and get the metadata. Because that was one of the terms that I was kind of unfamiliar with. The metadata is what you collect in order to be able to pull information up um, you know, on, online. When you do a Google search, it's pulling from the metadata. So anyway, Kathy became a friend. She did confide in me that she was dealing with cancer, that she was hoping for the best. And the middle of this last semester, she was not teaching a history harvest class, but we were continuing to collaborate with one of the students on a special project to still collect more information about GCAP and other organizations uh, LGBTQ related in the community. And got an email one day um, and it just said, I am having to stop teaching and my affiliation with the university to go under uh, you know, total medical care. And so, and then we just learned last Wednesday that she had passed. So the main presenters today, myself, I'm gonna be doing about 50 years of history and I'm gonna to try to condense it down into about 20, maybe 25 minutes <laughs> so that I can leave time for uh, Julie and Mike. And Julie Pride, everybody in this room, I'm sure knows Julie Pride. And I don't know whether she gets embarrassed when I say this, but I call her the goddess of champagne or bad public health. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that a lot of people knew this, but Julie kind of cut her social work teeth on HIV AIDS. And I'm gonna let her tell that story because I don't need to. And, Cause she does such a great job of telling a story. And then, of course, Mike Benner, who is the executive director, and I did the parentheses until the end of the month, because Mike is leaving his post at GCAP, and he once told me, I'm not retiring. I'm going to go on to something else, 
but this allows him to be full time with his partner slash husband in Lafayette. And so pursuing some new adventures. And um, so anyway, Mike, we are so grateful for the time that you've spent with GCAP. And I know we'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. So there you have it. Oh, and in terms of the trajectory for the program, um, we're hoping to allow at least 15 minutes or so at the very end before three o'clock, like 2.45, so that if somebody hasn't had a chance to peruse the exhibit, to be able to do so. But we know some of you have probably already been over and have observed the exhibit, and um, you might prefer to stay in and ask questions, make comments, so we can do a little bit of a hybrid thing. Um, and I'm, I'll stick around as long as anybody wants to chat and talk, which I know drives my husband crazy. My <laughs> husband is here, Tim Temple, who is born with me through all of this, uh, project. So the Greater Community AIDS Project um, can be Central Illinois. These are our co-sponsors and the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, Uniting Pride of Champaign County, who is doing our live streaming today. Nicole Friedman is here with us so that people can be participating from home. And for those of you at home, we wave hello to you. And this uh, Spurlock has been wonderful in terms of providing the auditorium for us to do a variety of presentations. I've done quite a few this semester for different University of Illinois classes that um, the museum specifically markets the program to programs that are related to whatever topic they happen to have um, you know, on exhibit here. And so we've done some of those and uh, they're recording the program. They're going to edit it so that this can become more of an archival piece. So we're trying to be a little bit more formal about this one than we have sometimes in the past. And I'm listing the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana-Champaign because they are my family. <laughs> and every year we are required by the UUA, which is the Unitarian Universalist Association, to have some sort of education program that has LGBTQ content. Well, since I was involved in this, I decided this was going to be this year's program. So we are keeping track of how many of you UUs are here. We actually had an OLLI class in here the other day, and there's quite a few UUs and OLLI, so we're counting all of them, too, so that we can prove that we had at least 10% of our membership participate in this program. And they are the people that give me the energy to be involved in community involvement work. And the units at the University of Illinois we talked about Kathy, and I want to back up one chain in my involvement in this, and I think at the very bottom of that slide, I have Nathan Alexander. Is Nathan here? Nathan, thank you so much. His introduction to Kathy and the class in 2019 started this whole process. We went in and we talked to the 2019 class about local LGBTQ history. There was a cohort that was really interested in pursuing that, and that's how we got started on this whole trajectory. And in the process, Kimberly Cronick, um, well, and getting to Spurlock involved Beth, because Kathy Overdeck knew Beth Watkins over here at Spurlock, and we were looking for a place to get these quilt panels photographed. That was one of the goals that Mike Benner and I had before he actually left his role at GCAP to get professional grade photographs of the panels. And Beth said, oh, well, you could bring them over to Spurlock. So we set them up here on this stage and Travis uh, did the photography for us and in Behind the Mask, is that you, Travis? No. <laughs> It's really hard for me to tell, but he's behind a camera. So I was thinking maybe that was Travis. So um, we got the pictures of the panels and the people from Spurlock came in and they saw what was happening and they saw the panels unfurled and they said, we have to have these on exhibit. So that's exactly how the exhibit began. And we went from there. Um, WILL, Illinois Public Media, heard about the project and Kimberly Cronick and Professor Stretch Ledford. I know Kimberly is not in town just yet. She's gonna be back in town for a special service at the UU Church tomorrow, We're still dealing with this subject. 10-15, um, <laughs> I guess I thought I could maybe get a little advertisement in there. We're dealing more with the emotional side of dealing with this whole topic. 
<laughs> but um, Kimberly and Professor Ledford from the College of uh, Journalism put together oral histories. And those are available on the uh, Illinois Public Media website. And if we have time today, in fact, I'm gonna make time. I want you to all hear a sample. And Georgia King, we weren't sure if Georgia was gonna make it today, but Georgia is one of the reasons GCAP is actually still in existence. And I don't see a hand going up anywhere, but I think there was a golf outing that probably took her, uh, her interest more than being in here. And uh, we wanna share her oral history. But awesome, awesome person. And I believe that's all the credits that I need to remember here. So setting the stage for AIDS, the national perspective. 1969 Stonewall Riots, uh, we hear about it pretty much every year on the anniversary of that last weekend in June. So I don't think I need to tell anything more about that. We already know that history and I need to keep moving. In 1970s, uh, you know, the Stonewall kind of sparked that gay liberation and people coming out of the closet and men having a lot more sex with men. I mean, it's always happened. But <laughs> during the 70s, it became more open. People felt more comfortable coming out of the closet. And it was all pre-AIDS. I was in that era. I graduated high school in 74, college in 78. I was young. I had hormones. And yeah, I, I was at risk for developing HIV AIDS because of my behaviors as a lot of us, us were. And think of uh, 1978, you know, toward the end of the 70s era, I think disco, village people, that party hearty vibe, that was what uh, a lot of us were fueled on and probably a fair amount of alcohol. But no one knew that this deadly virus was lurking uh, during the last part of the 70s. And I highlighted 1981. That was the year that we began hearing about the cases of what were then called the gay cancer or the gay plague. And I know Tim and I, but there was no internet for those of you that are, um, don't remember when there was no internet. So we relied on newspapers like gay rags, like the advocate for our news related to the gay community. And I remember when they were talking about the gay cancer, the gay plague, and it was middle of the year in 1981. And last year, we decided to focus on some of the history just because it was 40 years since that uh, those first cases of AIDS were seen. And in early, the early 80s, uh, the case numbers grow in cities. And here in the Midwest, we often look at the things that are happening in the large cities and we hope it doesn't come here. Or we think, oh, that, that won't happen here. But then we know deep down it, it will. And so we're all kind of worried well at that point, although some of us weren't well, uh, just didn't know it. And uh, there were constant new findings through the 80s. And again, with no internet, you were relying on uh, magazines, you were relying on print media, you were relying on medical journals, you were relying on your local uh, physicians that worked in infectious disease, like many of us at UU know uh, Dr. Terry England. And, um, there were others working at Carl, and their names are kind of escaping me now, but we all were always pressing them for information, what they knew uh, from the medical journals, from the CDC, Morbidity and Mortality World, World, uh, World Report. And fighting AIDS, get the facts. I don't know how many times during that era that I would see public service announcements on TV, in print media, but oh my God, we couldn't talk about how you actually avoid getting AIDS. We couldn't talk about sex or sexual practices. And that's what drove us doing this work, the, the craziest and angriest, is that people didn't want to talk about it. So in Champaign-Urbana, the first cases were seen in hospitals. I started my career in healthcare education and community education in 1979 at a place called Burnham Hospital, which some of you might remember. And I remember when uh, I heard that a case had been admitted that lived in Bloomington Normal. He was either a professor or a businessman and didn't want to be known as having AIDS and was afraid that people might find out if he were hospitalized there. And that happened a fair amount of time. Um, and but the first people that I knew, uh, Jimmy Walters was hospitalized at Burnham. Now remember, this is all pre-HIPAA. So there wasn't as many um, precautions against staff talking about. 
and with this particular disease, word spread, even as inappropriate as it was. But another uh, local case was Howard Wexler, who was a professor of Chinese history here at the university. Well respected, wonderful, wonderful uh, person. And those were the reasons that many of us decided to put our heads together and say, okay, we need to be prepared if it does come here. Well, in fact, it was here. And what are we going to do? Because we're going to have more cases. So in 1985, GCAP was born, uh, the Gay Community AIDS Project, and the Champaign County Community Task Force on AIDS formed soon after that. I want to give a shout out a couple times, because I know Julie's going to give a shout out to this person, but Joan Lathrop is another goddess of public health. I will call her goddess one and Julie goddess two. <laughs> because Joan Lathrop had to buck the powers that be at Champaign-Urbana Public Health because the person that was administrator at the time was definitely, um, I don't know if I want to say good old boy, but you get the drift. And he didn't want to spend any money or any time on the gay community. I won't say any more. And, but once uh, Joan learned about the, the Gay Community AIDS Project, we joined forces, didn't matter to Joan, and we formed a great partnership in working together with the community that was affected, as well as the local health care uh, services, social services, uh, blood bank, uh, all the agencies that had anything to do with HIV AIDS were involved in that county task force. The earliest goals of the Gay Community AIDS Project, you can read this while I say the two main goals were providing services, starting with the Buddies Project, which was direct support services to people with HIV slash AIDS, and then also the education for not just the gay community, but for the larger community in general. One of our first activities that we didn't really have any money for, so it came out of our own pockets or kind donors, we put up billboards. Remember, there was no internet. So we thought, how do we let people know that we even exist? So there were billboards at some of the main intersections and there were MTD buses driving around for maybe a year, year and a half with these placards on the side. That's not the day that they did the all, they papered the entire bus with the advertising. It was just those bus placards. But we wanted to let people know that there was a number that they could call that was staffed every evening. It was volunteers from GCAP and it was not an emergency line, but it would just, many of the calls that we got were, hey, I'm married, I had a little bit too much to drink last night, I went out and I had sex with somebody that I shouldn't have, and do you think I have AIDS? Well, back then, you had to wait, early on there were no tests, and even uh, after there were tests, you had to wait a certain amount of time from the actual sexual activity or whatever, whatever the point of transmission was or could have been, and, it was so complicated and over time we began to learn more and more and it was always changing in terms of what you could tell people so keeping those volunteers on the phone line informed was pretty difficult too and sometimes you were making a call to whoever was volunteering on a particular night with whatever you had that was new information so some of the early challenges we didn't have any money those expenses were from our own pocket, from some of the early deaths, which included Jimmy Walters, his mother, who lived out in Homer, and just a fabulous woman, Olive. Oh, I've met so many wonderful people as a result of volunteering with GCAP, but um, she wanted to make sure the memorial money went to uh, the work that we were doing. And we had a local state rep, I don't want to talk too much about that right now, because I know that this person recently passed, that they put all kinds of roadblocks in front of us in terms of getting any money. And when the State Department of Public Health wanted to give us money, he would find a way to get it blocked. Not always, we, we eventually figured out a way to work around it and there's lots of stories I can tell, but again, I need to stay on task here. The stress and the fear made it hard for us to always work together and play well together. A bunch of gay men that are all scared they might be sick and dying and we all had different ideas as to how we should move forward whether we should be two different groups one education one um, direct services and so there was a lot of this going on back and forth and um, sometimes feelings got hurt people but we always came back together because we had that mission and we knew we had to keep going but i want to give a shout out to reverend charlie Schweitzer. 
he was the glue that helped us keep it together and focus on what our goal was. And there were many other people that, that did that, but Charlie and McKinley was the uh, local church that really had the most going for the local gay community before really any others did. And I'm sorry to say, but before the Unitarian Universalists did, but we've, we've changed that. So shout out for McKinley. Um, getting a complete message into schools was difficult because the schools would say, sure, you can come in and give this part of your presentation. They wanted to see all the slides ahead of time. But when it came to actually which bodily fluids we're talking about, no, 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 we can't talk about that. It should just say no. And the media message, I think I talked about this a little bit earlier. They said protect yourself, but we couldn't talk about how to protect yourself. We had media challenges with the News Gazette. Uh, they wouldn't take our ads, even when we were saying we are, we are willing to pay for ads to get the information out there. No articles about safer sex practices editorials against our efforts. And uh, they wouldn't run names of partners and obituaries, and that was especially hurtful when people were losing their partners. And um, even to say, when somebody wanted to say the person died of HIV AIDS or related causes, they wouldn't do it. Now, that did change over time. I want to make sure I point that out. <clears throat> Some of the additional activities, um, I've, I've mentioned some of these already. We had a newsletter, there's a sample on the slide, a speaker's bureau presentation that we did for a number of different groups. Um, I've talked about the county task force uh, and billboards, educational pamphlets. We had a series of 21 pamphlets, they were trifolds, that looked at different aspects of HIV AIDS. And uh, those were hard to keep updated because again, no internet, and we just relied on people like, especially Steve Gallagher, who combed the literature and helped us come up with the most, uh, be the best information. We had lots of fundraisers. Uh, we had a gay men's chorus from 1984 to 1994. I'd like to see that start up again. The, the gay men's chorus folded because we lost our director to AIDS, Bob Beasley. And we were all so kind of traumatized at that point by losing so many people in such a short time that it was hard for us to bring it back together again. And Amazon, uh, actually the gay men's chorus formed before Amazon and then Amazon formed and we would do joint concerts together as fundraisers. And we had Artists Against AIDS, which many of you might remember uh, for about 20 years holiday gala fundraisers, station theaters. I want to give a shout out to Rick Orr. He brought plays here that we would have never had in Champaign Urbana if it weren't for him and the station theater. And he was, he's another local um, pillar that in terms of what he did, I'm thinking about Angels in America and some of the other titles escaped me, but they were dealing with that oh, HIV AIDS. Hmm? Normal heart. Oh, the normal heart, yes. If anybody else remembers one, just shout it out because I'm kind of, I'm getting at that age where it's hard to pull the brain cells out when I'm <laughs> really trying to. Okay, a couple slides with um, the Artist Against AIDS. The one on the left, I believe, was in the Orpheum Children's Theater. It was there for several years. And then the one on the right was, um, when M2 was being built, they hadn't sold all the floors yet. And so this was one floor of M2, but still open. And so they allowed us to come in with um, artworks. And it was paintings, it was ceramics, it was jewelry, it was all different kinds, sculpture. And the artist would get half, and then the uh, GCAP would get half. I believe that's how it was set up. I was not one of the major volunteers for Artists Against AIDS, but it took an army of volunteers to do it. And that's why it eventually went away, was we just, some of the volunteers that we relied on either moved away or moved away half of the year. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of Trent Shepard. I want to give Trent Shepard a shout out. Trent and many other people did so much for the Artist Against AIDS, but um, it, it had its time, and um, maybe another one of those, maybe we can start it again. I want to be sure and mention Champagne House. I think that's one of the things I've been proudest of. We were learning early on that people that had become infected with HIV uh, and diagnoses of AIDS they might be kicked out of their house. Maybe they were still living at home and their family finds out and, oh, sorry, you can't be here anymore. Or maybe they weren't living with their family, but they had a job and they had their own apartment, their own house, and they couldn't work. 
because early cases of AIDS were terribly debilitating and uh, people needed a place to live. And another group formed called the Prairie AIDS Foundation. And if anybody remembers Fran Friedman, she's another local powerhouse. And uh, somebody reminded me, oh, it was after the Ollie class I taught last, um, last Tuesday, that somebody said, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned Fran Friedman. And I'd forgotten about this, but I worked at Burnham Hospital, and just before I started there in the 70s, Fran had led a nurses' strike in order to get better, um, better pay for nurses. And so she was that kind of person that just caught on to local causes and just drove a, like a steamroller to help make things better. The Champagne House, um, it, it, Champagne House is still operating. Mike is gonna talk about Champagne House because he's our current face of what's happening with the Greater Community AIDS Project. Now I didn't mention it, I think that on one of the slides, we changed our name in 1995. That was one of our biggest controversies because especially within the gay community, there were people that felt like, oh my gosh, you are caving in to pressure from you know, the right wing or whatever. And there were lots of debates about whether to change the name or not, but it was actually Joan that was encouraging, Joan Lazer, who was encouraging to do that because it was difficult to reach into the black or uh, brown community, uh, you know, lower income, people that were marginalized with the name Gay Community AIDS Project. So we made the name change, we've survived it, and um, you know, I think there's still some people out there that are like, I don't wanna give them any money because they changed their name. Well, and some of those people that got kind of incensed about it actually weren't really involved to begin with. It just, they liked to be incensed. <laughs> I think, mean, you know. And Georgia King, don't, you don't have to move again. On this slide, Georgia King is over here. Uh, a much younger Georgia King. I know I stepped away from the mic for those of you at home. And so I wanted to point out on the left uh, is Georgia King paint stripping a column. Th there were just hundreds, if not thousands of hours that went into this house and remodeling it from a typical kind of a big old house. Um, it's located in um, yeah, Champaign. We won't we give the actual address just because you never know. And things are beginning to turn ugly again. And we just would rather not have people know exactly where it's located. Um, but they started off with five different bedrooms or little tiny apartments. And I believe one of them, there were two that were pulled together in order to provide more space for a family unit. Um, and Mike will talk more about Champagne House. Um, there's an article about uh, the Prairie AIDS Foundation and then getting on to the quilt I'm sure that everyone here has heard about the Names Project um, AIDS Memorial Quilt that started in San Francisco very early on in the AIDS pandemic. And Cleve Jones was the originator. And from what I understand, the original idea was small panels. And in fact, they, they drew them out uh, having coffee somewhere. You know how you sit around having coffee and you start drawing and making diagrams on little cocktail napkins? At least that's what I remember reading. But then it grew to let's make an impact with these. Let's have something of size that we can give the personality of the person and get more information on, but also the impact of a human grave. The panels were designed to be the size three by six of a human grave. And of course, like everything that happened on the coast ends up coming to us in the Midwest, there were people here that wanted to put their energies into um, making a panel for their loved one. And the first person that I knew about was Jimmy Walters, the guy that cut my hair, and I wanted to make a quilt panel for him, so I did. There was a duplicate made by a cousin in Colorado that's actually at the AIDS Memorial Quilt. The local panel ended up getting lost, you know, sometimes when things are loaned out to different places to display, they don't always make it back. And that did happen with some of our local quilt panels but by now you've had a chance to read that um, some of these panels have a duplicate at the National AIDS Memorial and some of them don't. And then some of the panels that were made for local people, we actually either don't have uh, or they're ones that were lost. And so the little brochure that you picked up, if you did pick it up, 
are the ones that we don't have, but I wanted to be sure that their biographies were included, and many of them were friends as well. And, and of all the panels that are in the other room, I didn't know all those people. The main ones that I knew, my dear friends, were uh, Steve Gallagher and Merrill Eskew. And Steve Gallagher was really um, kind of a godsend for H, uh, GCAP at the time. He was a bundle of energy, somebody that never had gotten a degree, that always regretted never getting a degree because here he was hanging out with all these professors. In fact, he dated some professors. And even though they didn't really make him feel less than for not having that degree, he made himself feel less than. So he read voraciously novels, books, all the books that you would expect to have read, you know, going through through school. And he loved newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, all of the major newspapers, and he just wanted to know everything. So when AIDS came along, he sent all of his energies into learning about AIDS, and he was the one that really helped us keep things up to date because of that veracity and, and reading and his interest. Well, over time, um, and, and Steve was my best friend outside my relationship. I met him in recovery circles. And in fact, on the far right corner, uh, this is his panel that I helped make with Steve Otto and several other people. The one that says, trudging the road to happy destiny is a reference, uh, a phrase that's used in 12-step recovery circles. Um, my sobriety date was July 12th, 81, and his was 11-14-83. Uh, and so I was served as a sponsor for Steve, and we became very, very close through that process. So when he was diagnosed, we were both devastated, but he threw himself into that knowledge gathering. He also made quilt panels for a period of time. People locally that wanted to make quilt panels, whether they knew someone or not, they met at McKinley. Again, McKinley was a haven for LGBTQ folks. And I think the pictures, the black and white pictures were at McKinley. Steve was making one for Mike Hyman, who became a very close friend of his when uh, Steve served as a buddy for Mike. Mike Hyman was a banker, a bank manager in Rantoul who had a big mouth and a big personality. And he decided that he was going to use that personality because people already loved Mike, and that he was going to help educate Rantoul about HIV AIDS. He was not gonna hide and he did that. But he also volunteered for GCAP. He became one of our chairs um, and uh, another wonderful volunteer. Well, Steve made the quilt panel, but then a few years later in 1991, we were making the quilt panel for Steve. Oh, and Julie is gonna have a story about the degree. Steve finally got his degree, his MSW. <laughs> and Julie made that little square on this quilt panel because that was part of the trajectory, but she'll talk about that. Those panels were in many 4th of July parades. We didn't have a pride parade in Champaign-Urbana until just, gosh, has it been eight maybe years? Ten. 13. 13 years? Oh, 13, more, 13, 13. more than I'm remembering. <laughs> but prior to that, we're all familiar with the 4th of July parade. And we would be in the 4th of July parade, which was great, because we were showing the AIDS quilt panels to the rest of the community. And for the most part, people got quiet. They were very reverent when we came by. They understood what it was about. We didn't typically get the cat calls that some of the other LGBTQ groups got in certain areas of the parade route, which I won't talk about, because again, I'm running out of time. And the National Quilt, We'll send sections of the quilt out, and this happened quite a lot uh, in the Midwest as it did throughout the country. And um, I remember going up to see uh, large sections of the quilt at Navy Pier, when Navy Pier was not this big carnival space, but it was just a great big armory style building. And we brought some of the quilt panels here to the University of Illinois. I say we, I was not a part of that project, but anybody that knows Kurt McKay, I think he was a major driver in that and i know i'm probably not remembering to give everybody credit throughout this you know quick little rendition of time but the pictures on the um, left side of the screen well all these pictures are from the um, exhibit at the union 
And these will be familiar with uh, some of the quilt panels that are shown in your little brochure. They're the ones that uh, aren't in this exhibit, but they were local people. And I think in the interest of time, you can read their biographies rather than me talk about them. And this one is super sad. I did not know who it represented. I'm not sure that really whoever made it did, of course, but, and you can't read the name of the town, but it was Streeter. And when you read the biographies of some of the quilt panels out in the other room, you'll notice that we were not able to get information on all of those. And some of them that I expected, that I, I knew people that knew them, but one guy in particular, um, he's known by a lot of the gay men in town as Farmer Bob, and there are, there's a quilt panel for Pat and Bobby who were farmers. And he knew them, and we were wanting to gather information from him. And when I first contacted him, because we're Facebook friends, and Bob himself is a long-term survivor because he developed HIV very early on in the, in the pandemic. And when I contacted him again the second time, he just said, I started going back through the photos and the albums. And he said, I just sob. He said, I, I can't go back there anymore. So we didn't press that. But um, Kim Cronick was able to actually get some more information from a niece. Kim is a great detective, I found out. So that, that was another wonderful collaborator. And I want to make sure that I mention the oral histories. And if we have time more before we release you to go look at the panels, um, we'll play at least one. You know what? I think Mike and I talked about we want to play one for, for sure, especially because she couldn't be here today. And that's Georgia King, who lost her son. To AIDS. But I want to make sure and give a shout out. These are on, and you can listen to them at the Illinois Public Media website. Um, so if you just do a simple search, um, it's actually a very easy website. And uh, I can't show them from this screen because those are not links. But let me navigate to a different web page. As many years has gone by, you would think I'd have my emotions in check, but I don't. You know, it's it's like it just, you know, it doesn't seem like it was that many years ago. It's like it was yesterday. And the pain is still there, and I guess it always will be. Greg was a very loving child, a very kind child. Shortly after, I think he was seven years old when his father and I divorced. So Greg became like the man in the home. And Greg probably had more responsibility as a young child than, than maybe he should have. But he grew into a fine young man. He was very dependable, very honest. And he, he, he dated girls and everything. And I think he was probably uh, maybe a sophomore in high school. He called me on the telephone. He couldn't even tell me in person. He called me on the telephone. He said, Mom, you know that thing you've been wondering about me and I keep denying? I said, yes. He said, I want you to know it's true. And that's how I found out my son was gay. When Greg and I were on one of our, one of our trip, before we left there, he did get sick. And I really worried about even being able to get him home. And I did get him home. And he lived in Louisville, Kentucky. And I got a hold of a doctor there and got him in. And they told me that he had, uh, that he had AIDS. He did uh, AZT. I think AZT was the first one. And he started having complications, so they took him off of that. And then he went to DDI, which was the second one. And he started having liver problems and everything, so they had to take him off of that. So he was to the point where there really wasn't anything that they could do for him. And that's when I brought him back. My son wanted me to make a difference in his name. He wanted me to educate people, and he wanted me to explain to people how they can and cannot get AIDS. He wanted me to reach out and help people living with AIDS. He said, Mom, you're a strong woman. I want you to do it for me. And I really tried very hard to do that. He was very frail, and he wanted to see the AIDS quilt in Chicago. And I'm not sure what was going on in his mind. I'm not sure what would be going on in my mind if I were there and I would know one of these days I was going to be one of those quilt panels. 
I made Greg's panel myself. It's still hard on me when I see it today, but when I was doing it, I was okay. I was glad to be doing it. I thought it was something that Greg would be happy about. And I, I didn't want any help with it. I wanted to be the one that did all of it, and I did. I met Meryl by his uh, lover, partner. That was a preview of Meryl Estrue's panel, another, another dear friend and a wonderful story. If you remember the Little Professor bookstore, Meryl and his partner Jerry purchased that. And Jerry is here, I believe, way back up. I recognize his face. And... Um, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and just show that. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. I met Meryl, my uh, lover, partner, through a coming out support group. I was one of the facilitators and Meryl was one of the participants. And uh, we started dating soon after that. I want to laugh with you, but I know there won't be anyone to share in my joy. I want to cry to you, but I know there won't be anyone to wipe away my tears. My parents got divorced um, when I was in second grade. So most of my life with him was spent with him um, as, a, as a single parent. He loved taking us on vacation in the summers. Um, we were usually gone for a couple weeks, hop in the car you know, drive, you know, a million hours. Merle was working as a flight controller and getting tired of doing that. We were sort of looking for something else for him to do. He was looking, I was, and we discovered the little professor was for sale. I had a full-time job at the university, so it was basically Merrill running the store and me dropping by after work and on weekends. The illness developed slowly. He was losing weight for probably a year. There wasn't a lot of time between his diagnosis and when he passed. I think he was diagnosed in 88 or 89. I was told my freshman year of college in 1991. After we did our year-end inventory in uh, 1991, he didn't go back to the bookstore at all. Uh, maybe dropped in occasionally, but was not well enough to actually work at the store. When he was really sick, I did see him a few times. I don't know how many. There were times that he would not allow me to come when I wanted to come because either there were sores on his face, he was not feeling well, or he just, the appearance he thought was going to freak me out. I think looking back on that, I should have ignored him and gone anyway. One of the things that came out in the last two years of his life was how little he complained about the difficulties he was having. I'm not sure whether you would call it stoic, but uh, he did not spend a lot of time thinking, oh, poor me, or why me, or uh, and just dealt with it on a day-to-day -day basis, mostly. This is a teaser. You can see these at the Illinois Public Media website. There's also a kiosk around the first corner as you go out into the main room where these will also play on a little um, pedestal. So I want to introduce 
And every time I see Merrill, I start to cheer up. So, sorry. Julie hasn't even seen this slide. <laughs> but she's a professional. Julie? Julie Pride, the goddess of the Champagne Urbana Public Health District. <laughs> I, I hope I didn't make a mistake by putting up the panel of her friend, but you could do it. No, but perhaps playing and talking about what you did. <laughs> uh, okay. I, okay. What do you got me speaking about here, Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Down here. I know, I'm kidding. Um, wow. Okay. Um, first of all, a shout out to Little Professor Bookstore because that was the place in Champaign if you wanted to get a gay newspaper, that's where you had to go. Um, and if you wanted to get a lot of gay newspapers of different kinds, you had to go to Chicago. That's literally where we were getting our information back then, and that's where we were all learning about AIDS. Let me tell you a little bit of how I came to be in public health. Okay, it's a bizarre story, but it goes right through, and this is, uh, I always say that, you know, COVID was my third pandemic. Well, HIV was my first pandemic. So believe it or not, I came from this teeny weeny town that in, it's called Moroa, it's right over north of Decatur. And um, I remember a lot of gay people that popped out of that town. Now, I do not know why, but there did seem to be. Mel was one of them. He was a year younger than me and we went to, um, we went to school together through kindergarten. We were both in the percussion section of the band, or like I like to say, I played drums, Mel played cymbals. Because <laughs> he always got stuck with that. Um, but so Mel and I went on to work in the same um, company. We worked for Case Merchandise Corporate Office. I was an advertising artist, and Mel was a costume jewelry buyer. And once we uh, linked ourselves together in like 1980, Five, I think it was when we started working together, uh, we just became absolute hellions. We were inseparable, we were just wild. <laughs> That's all I can say. A uh, little preface to that. I did go into recovery in 1991, so let's just get that out of the way in case any little stories I can tell. <laughs> but Mel and I um, had you know, just a wild time. We would always go to Chicago together, and um, we would always go to Chicago together and go to the bars, Back then, believe it or not, the men went to one bar and the women went to another bar in Chicago a lot of the time, which was just really weird. And I wanted to go with Mel because that's where the fun was, in my opinion, except for the obvious fun. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so we had, would have to go to separate bars, so uh, we would drive up to Chicago together and it was just a fun. And obviously, you know, it's raining men. We played that song to death like everyone our age did. And um, then I was sitting in my office in, I remember exactly when it happened. I was, we were listening to the radio in, in my office. He had a different office, but I was in there with the, the people of advertising and they were doing some kind of a story on, on uh, WILL. Uh, and it was about, you know, the stuff that was happening with HIV on the coast and that people were being ostracized and stigmatized and people couldn't, um, they weren't giving them their food. You know, they were setting trays outside the room and, and that absolutely ate at me. It ate at me so much that I decided right then and there, I could do that. I could work with people that have AIDS. That's stupid treating them like that. And so um, being, you know, young and and adventurous, I just decided to quit working in advertising and go to the U of I to quote unquote, work with people that have AIDS. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant, um, but the psychology department quickly booted me out over to talk to the social work department. Um, I had never heard of social work, um, but that's where I landed and that's where I met Steve. Um, and, and that's where they then sent me, because I wanted to work with AIDS, they sent me to public health, which was Joan Lathrop. So she and I have known each other for a very, very long time. I just got off the phone with her this morning. Um, 
And so that's kind of how a lot of that stuff connects. And I love, I'm, I'm a little bit emotional because I saw a lot of people in there, including Steve. Yeah, Steve. Um, Steve was in the social work department. We, we were um, students together at the same time. He was a wonderful, wonderful, very smart man. I also saw um, Steve Otto in there. Um, Steve Otto is the one who taught me um, to use Macintosh and to be the layout editor and well, the ed yeah, the editor and not editor, but layout editor and the um, work on the G capsule at the time, which was the newsletter. So anyway, there were a lot of uh, memories in there. And it also made me feel old, which I'm getting sick of Jerry doing that to me. <laughs> older, not old, older. So anyway, I, I, um, I remember the day that Steve um, had, had the, um, Steve had a, a brain lesion caused by HIV AIDS. And I remember the day we were at the School of Social Work and we were talking, we were standing in, in the entryway there by the stairs, and, and all of a sudden his, his words became jumbled. And that was it, pretty much. That was the. I also, of course, remember the day uh, my friend Mel called me. I had worked in AIDS with Joan Lathrop um, as an intern. And like, like Jerry said, Joan, uh, you didn't mess with Joan. <laughs> you just didn't, because she was going to do it, and she was going to do it right. Um, I am absolutely blessed and I am who I am today because I had her um, in my life as a, guide, as a guiding light. And one of the first things she did when I started working there, other than uh, make me learn to draw blood, like that was the most normal thing for a social worker to do. Um, <laughs> I still do, I keep my competencies up, so. <laughs> but it was just, you know, she told me she wanted to know why um, people in the African American community might not be comfortable coming to public health or services or, um, or HIV, getting HIV AIDS information from us. And I said, I, no, I don't. And she said, do you know about Tuskegee study? And I said, no. She handed me a book. There was, there was no go home and read this book. When Joan handed you a book, you went home and you read the book. And, and you understood that when she um, gave you something like that, that there was significance in it and you needed to really pay attention. And I was, I believe that I got more of my education that from uh, Joan and, and Fran Friedman and the, the people that we're talking about and the, the people in GCAP and, and the doctors and various people I worked with than I ever did at, um, the U of I, which was a wonderful education. But so that's how a commercial artist landed at public health. Um, but when, so I was volunteering there, but when my friend Mel called and told me, that he was in the hospital, he had just got back from Mexico, I knew uh, immediately and I was done. I was done. I, I quit everything. And from when he died till a little bit after he died until 92, I was done. Or 95, I mean, when I finally came back to work at public health and, and, and recommitted myself to working in HIV AIDS. I worked in it, but in a different, different sense after that. Because when I was an intern, with Prairie Gates Foundation and Public Health, um, I had 11 clients. I can't remember how old I was, but I was young. I had 11 clients that I was assigned to. Every single one of them died, and half of them were younger than me. That, coupled with my friend Mel, taught me an important lesson. I am not cut out for direct service, <laughs> <laughs> as you can see. So. I, I've been in the policy research area of it, and uh, and I was ready to go back work at public health. Um, and you know, Joan called constantly called me about jobs, and I just couldn't do it. But about '95, for whatever reason, I was able to go back, and I have been there ever since. So I actually started out at public health as an intern, an unpaid bachelor in social work intern, and I'm the administrator now. So that's kind of a weird path, but. Um, I know what it looks like behind the scenes. Oh, I have one other little story. Jerry talked about how quiet everyone was in, uh, you know, in the 
panels went by. Did I mention I was a drinker? <laughs> well, I had a tequila canteen um, <laughs> during the 4th of July parade, and I was standing in front of the McKinley Health Center with my partner at the time, and just enjoying the day, the, the quilt panels came by, and we were all quiet as usual, and the little frat guy standing next to me um, screamed, I don't believe faggots die of AIDS. And that was the first time I'd punched anyone in the mouth. <laughs> And thank God it was before cameras, because I can assure you, uh, J Joan would not have given me that job probably <laughs> if I had done that. But I, I literally snapped and I punched him. He fell to the ground. His friends laughed. My partner dragged me away. Um, and I think that's why you got a lot of peace and quiet on that route after that, Jerry. I, I am going to take credit for that. <laughs> That. Don't get me wrong. I don't suggest ever doing that. But that was a that was a very sensitive. Um, you know, when the quilt panels came by, that's not a time to do for the hate to come out. Um, and and having been on this journey, you know, I thought that the hate was gone. But as we can see, it, they're not gone, but it was greatly diminished. But it has come back with a vengeance. And we all need to lock arms and um, and continue pull, pushing forward because we are not going back on anything, so. so. Again, I have to talk about how, how we all worked together at the time as a community, and there, there was a time where Joan Lathrop was really about the only one outside of GCAP who was, who was doing anything, and as she brought funding in and and kept things moving, and she was able to get staff. And needless to say, she hired staff who who were going to um, go along with the mission of, of taking care of people with HIV/AIDS. Joan wasn't uh, well; she she still is, but she's not doing it anymore. But an amazing, uh, creative social worker, and she would get things done. And we came up with something when I was an intern working with Prairie AIDS Foundation, and. Joan was very good about figuring out how to do, how to get around barriers. And um, we were able to get a lot of people housed because of her, her creativity. And um, I'm not going to tell you what my trick is but uh, that she taught me, but it, it went on for 20 or more years. So there's always a way. And Joan always knew who to talk to, and, and, and she was always always respectful with everyone um, talking to them. And, and every single person that she talked with uh, was a teachable, teachable moment. So I have tried to emulate that, but I feel um, like if Joan had a mean streak, that'd be me, kind of. Um, <laughs> because she is never like sarcastic or <laughs> anything, but she, no, she, she, the, the, the impact that she had on the aid services that got here, it was, it was Carl, it was, because um, Carl was the first to step up, Dr. England, and Dr. Um, Johnson, Philip Johnson, who you're probably thinking about earlier, um, that all the nurses, um, uh, Cindy Getting uh, from ORS, um, lots of nurses over the years, and a lot of, lot of, uh, lot of creativity. So let me see, what else am I supposed to talk about? I already talked about. Um, Current challenges in public oh, health approach, so, I know Mike yeah. is gonna also do Yeah, I'm gonna, that. it might surprise you to know that Jerry probably went a little over time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm we actually still have plenty of time. Okay, um, but so, the, you know, when, when COVID came around, there, there were so many things that reminded me of HIV. Um, the the misinformation, the disinformation, the the stigma, the um, just now we didn't have quite as many, but I did need to remind you that in the early '80s, when we were first dealing with HIV AIDS, we had, AIDS, we had Ronald Reagan, and he was horrid, horrid towards HIV AIDS, and and that's too big of a topic, and you need to read several books to know all the, the crap that went on back then, but it was it was bad and it could have been much better. Um, 
with COVID, there was some of that too, the foot dragging and things like that. But so we still, you know, HIV AIDS, I have been kind of on the front row since I started working at public health because public health has always been involved since then. And, um, you know, the, the housing has gotten better. Once we, what I like to remember about the whole HIV AIDS uh, struggle is that we finally saw that the government, when the government does what they need to do, it can make a tremendous difference. So we got the Housing Opportunity for People with AIDS Act or HOPWA. We got, um, you know, the Ryan White, which was, you know, clearly Ryan White was the only person ever to have it, had AIDS up until that point, but that was also a bone of contention. <laughs> But you know, we 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 saw that that the government putting money into the things that that the uh, community was saying made a difference. It made a huge difference, and that was done 100% because of the gay community coming together and demanding it, just absolutely demanding it because nothing was being done. So if you get a chance to watch some early history films on that, you know, do it because what they're showing, literally people in the streets demanding it and act up. And, you know, I got to go to one act up uh, when I was working with Joan, I was a student and I got to go to California um, to San Francisco and to San Jose for the International AIDS Conference and the, which I did not pay to go for. I just kind of snuck into there, thanks to a gay man that I met there while I was at my social work at AIDS conference. He snuck me in, <laughs> but and that was during the huge um, immigration naturalization uh, survey or survey uh, protest. So it was that was amazing um, to to get that opportunity. But you know, those are the things that um, those are the things that when you look back you can really see how much grassroots and how much um, people simply uh, not sitting down, not accepting that we are not worthy of, of love, we're not worthy of government, our government, it's our government too, we're not worthy of protection or it, anything from our government, they demanded it, got it, finally. And one of the other beautiful legacies of that is the what's what we call uh, community uh, planning. So as the money came down from the federal government, the CDC to um, the state health departments, in order for that money to be received and then dispersed, you had to have community planning groups, which I was on from way to the beginning, basically. That's actually the job I came to take as a, as a regional uh, lead agent. That's the job I started with the public health. Um, and what that is, is that requires that people sitting around the table deciding what needs to be done with this money were the people that it was impacting. And so at these meetings, we had, you had to make sure that the people around there were people living with HIV AIDS. It was uh, gay men who were at risk. It was injection drug users who were at risk. It was um, people, women of, at the time, women who, um, who were potentially, um, you know, sex partners of, of people or were sex partners of people who were at risk for being HIV infected. So it made a big difference. We also made sure on these panels that there were medical people there, that there were social workers there, that there were people from all these different disciplines so that they were bringing their input in, but they were also listening to the people who were impacted. Um, that is a model that I think is lacking in so much of the stuff that we do today, so much of the work that we do in public health, and I have tried to get it back. We do it locally, but we need to see it bigger. You know, we need to see this coming in with all the money to the, as far as I'm concerned, to the, from the state level on down to the local. You have to have that input or you're, or you're just guessing. You're just guessing, and it wastes time and it wastes money. So I would like to see that you know part continue. To see where we are now, I, I literally sat at my desk and cried the day that um, we found out we were going to be able to start a prep clinic in Champaign. I couldn't, 
I couldn't believe that there was something called prep, and I'm sure everybody in this room knows what that is, but um, I just, because at the time when I quit working in it, because I couldn't handle it anymore, I, at that point, I literally believed that everyone I knew was going to die. Every single person that I knew that was a gay man that I loved, that I was friends with, was going to die. And to get from that to the medicines kept getting better, the cocktails, and then prep, and, and who knows what's around the corner. And I also, real quick, just want to say the amazing things that have happened in the medical community because of HIV AIDS and, gay, and the gay community. If it were not for the gay male community, we would not have hepatitis B vaccination. It wouldn't exist. That was 100% because of gay men being involved in the studies. Um, a lot of the things that we take for granted during COVID, the emergency use authorization, that came about because the gay community and the AIDS community demanded it in the 80s, early 90s. So, all right. I see Jerry's getting antsy, so I'm going <laughs> to hop back over there. So, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Mike. I'm Mike Bennett. I four minutes. I four minutes. <laughs> Please give me five minutes. <laughs> no, I, I'm going to go through. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll kind of wrap this up a little bit here. No, if, if people want to look at the panels, you can stay beyond three. <laughs> That's very kind of you, Jerry, but you know, everybody should take a few minutes to go out there and look at those. They're, they're very powerful and bring back a lot of memories for me also. When I was a young man uh, in my early 20s in Springfield in the early 80s, um, I was losing a lot of friends relatively quickly. And very similar to what Julie had to say is I got to the point that I got tired of going to funerals, and I just couldn't deal with it anymore. So, um, but now I'm a director of an agency that works specifically with people with HIV AIDS, um, and it's been very fulfilling over the years. And just kind of give you a brief overview of what GCAP does these days. Um, uh, one of the first things is our transitional housing facility. Uh, Jerry kind of alluded to Champagne House. Uh, Julie did with the Hopwa, the housing opportunity for people with AIDS. Um, but it has a dear place in my heart, too. So I'm one of the people that have gone through that house. Uh, it's a, Jerry said, it's a four-bedroom transitional housing facility that um, people have a place to live when they don't have any place else to live, but they also get these wonderful supportive services that um, aren't really offered in a lot of other places that they we have transitional housing. So um, I was there for three months, um, during which time I got sober. Um, I started working again. And I got out of a really crappy relationship. In fact, that's how I ended up in the house. Was I had been in the hospital three times that previous year on the um, 5E. So it's um, a matter of living, live or die at that point. And I said that was, I'd rather live it up in the park than actually go back to the relationship I was in. So Champagne House kind of was my safety net. And it'll always be that way for me. You know? And I'm happy to say that we continue to be doing that for people. I mean, that, here uh, since 1993, so that makes it what close to 30 years that it's been going on. And we still see people going through the door for a variety of reasons every day. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it's not always completely filled, like right now. And two months ago, I had four people in the house. This week, I have only one person with somebody coming in next week but we're able to offer really wraparound services. We have a full-time case manager that works with these individuals um, to get them to a better place. Um, we've started partnering with, partnering with CPHD. They've been very fortunate. They got this grant from HOPWA um, for tenant-based rental assistance. Um, that basically means that somebody that can go into housing, that part of their rent is gonna be paid while they're working on either getting a job having enough money so they can actually sustain um, permanent housing, or somebody that's um, maybe has to go into public housing, but ours are all waiting list for that. But the two agencies, GCAP and CUPHD, are partnering, partnering to kind of get that people people to that place where they just go from one type of housing situation to a much better type of housing situation. And I, I'm very proud of what we've been able to do in the last few years with that and continue to do. 
The other thing that she have offers is our emergency financial assistance. That's been going on for, I think they're probably doing that back in the 80s to a certain extent. But today we continue that. And of all things, our biggest request for is bus passes. Really. I mean, people that are on campus kind of get used to the fact that, okay, with my high card, I can get from one place to another without having to pay for it. Well, there's a lot of people in the community that don't have that privilege. So I mean, they need to get to their jobs, they need to get to their medical appointments and all these things. And really it's a relatively inexpensive fix for that transportation issue. But um, every year we give out 75 of those at least, uh, which we feel very proud of. Um, we also do offer assistance financial for like past due rent utilities and some other kind of unusual things. I think this past month I bought some big bedside table because um, they were basically bedridden and they had nothing, no place to put their food or anything like that. So it's like, yeah, we can get something like that for people. I mean, that's, that's what we do. We make people's lives a little bit better. We help empower them to do it to the next step. And finally, one of the big things we have is our um, dealing with food insecurities. We've had a food pantry now for the last 30 years, I believe, of some sort. I mean, for a long time, it was home delivered food. Um, in the past 15, 20 years, we've actually gone to a place where people can actually pick out their own food. Um, we had a really good working relationship with Eastern Online Food Bank, but they had gotten so big over the last 10 years that we're no longer able to let people do their own shopping there. So we've gone into the basement of New Company of Fellowship, and we have a food pantry down there that people are able to go down there, pick out their own things. Um, it's all dry goods, but still that's something that helps help good people from one month to the next. Uh, it's not a fix-all, but we also have many other food pantries in town, including one that CPHD has. Um, I forgot the name, the name of the place on Windsor Road. Um, Stone Creek, I believe it is, has a fantastic food pantry that I mean, they have fresh fruit and vegetables, meat, along with all the dry goods. So we kind of work with all these other agencies uh, to help people find these resources that they really need uh, within the community. And the next slide, I had a couple things, but um, just to kind of wrap it up, the biggest thing we have going on right now is for future goals, something to look forward to is getting to zero. That's an initiative that um, we've been working with the state. It's actually the, the state has been following the federal government, so it's just kind of a triple down effect. Um, but uh, we, the goal is to have zero new infections, um, zero people out of treatment, and. 100% of the people that are positive on, on medication. So what it's basically doing is that through biomedical technology, if you want to call it that, um, we can be able to prescribe PrEP, which is pre-exposure, and also PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis that people can get. Um, and also one of the biggest things that has come out in the last few years after PrEP is called U equals U undetectable equals untransmittable. Um, and with that in a short 30 second spiel is the fact that um, everybody that is HIV positive has a viral load of some sort. It can be anywhere from undetectable, meaning under 20 copies to in the millions. Um, undetectable, basically under 20 copies, a person cannot pass on HIV uh, through sexual contact, which I mean is a phenomenal thing. So the more people we are able to get that are Finally suppressed out of that below detectable, um, the quicker we'll be able to get um, to the point that we are getting to zero, that we have those no new infections. Um, so those are the three things that um, really have been making a big difference in the way that um, prevention has been looked at. And we'll still always have to abstinence and barrier methods, but when you can take a pill and make a change in your life and the other people's lives, it's a really big deal. I think the other thing that really needs to be addressed in the community is the, the aging population. Over half the people that live with HIV anymore are over 50 years old. And that's a good and a bad thing. It's good because people my age um, would have been dead by now if, they, if it wasn't for all the medications that we have today. So we have these, we have a generation, several generations of people that are getting older and looking, assessing what their needs are. Their needs may be something completely different and somebody that's 20 or 30 years old. So I, 
we're working closely with the state and the federal government to try to figure out what those specific needs are. Um, as we find those things out, we'll try to provide that services that we need in the community. So, that's it. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I just want to thank you all. And I just want to thank you for the support over the last uh, 40 years. I mean, it's been, well, I guess, 35 years. But, uh, it's been like, Every time I see a group of people like this out here, it really warms my heart when people still do care about HIV AIDS. I mean, it's something that still is out there, but we can conquer it. Given the right tools, we can conquer it. Thank you. Don't, don't sit down yet. I believe that uh, Nicole Friedman, the program director, is that the correct? Director of operations. Mm -hmm. Director of operations. She'll introduce herself. Sure. So, from <laughs> Uniting Pride, has something that she would like to share with Mike, so I will step away. Uh, yeah, Nicole Friedman, Director of Operations, Uniting Pride, relatively new in the community, new to uh, running Uniting Pride. Um, mm -hmm. But as soon as our board heard that Mike was gonna be stepping down and moving on to the next chapter of his life, uh, an immediate flurry of emails came through that we, we couldn't let that pass without some moment. Uh, of recognition, and we had already scheduled to help out to, to live stream this, and so we said, okay, let's at least take a moment. It's not nearly sufficient, but let's at least take a quick moment to honor the incredible contribution that Mike has made both to GCAP and to the community here at large. Um, you may not know, uh, you know, he, he mentioned being helped by GCAP. He started as a volunteer to give back, and then moved into staff and ultimately took over over 15 years of service to this particular organization, much longer than that, um, and, you know, in, in general in the community at large, and, and I'm sure he's gonna go on to do amazing things. We just made him a little certificate. We just thought we might just take a moment, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for all that you've done. You are a success story, and I just, when I learned of your story about receiving help at Champagne House, um, and, and having been through the addiction myself, and I sometimes mention that if I hadn't met my husband in 1981 and changed my behaviors because he told me I had to if I was gonna be in a relationship with him, I got sober. And otherwise, I know I, would, I wouldn't be here now. And Mike, I just know that the changes that you made in your life allow you to be here with us and serving others. And we truly, truly appreciate that in this community. And I just, before we close, and again, I know I said at the beginning that we were hoping we would allow 15 minutes out of our 90 minutes. We really had way more content that we should have tried to you know cram into 90 minutes and the panels are going to be up for another month july 10th they come down and so i encourage you if you don't have time to stick around this afternoon come back this next week is going to be super super hot so it'd be nice to come into the air conditioning at spurlock spend some time with the oral histories you can spend time with the oral histories at the WILL and Loi Public Media website. And there's lots of more information at the Spurlock Museum um, website as well. And the way that this collaboration came together by somebody talking to somebody, to talking to somebody, to talking to somebody else, and growing it and growing the interest, that's exactly the kind of thing that I have been told by the development people at um, the U of I that they want to see more of happening. And here, it happened without even planning it. And I do want to recognize, I know there are some uh, long-term volunteers of GCAP here today. Um, former volunteers or board, former or current volunteers and board members for GCAP. Way in the back, is that Michael and Tim? <laughs> Oh, 
Now, Michael, I know, was serving, Michael Lambert was serving as chair during the name change period of time, and I know that that was a very, very difficult time to be the chair of, of GCAP. There's so many that have served, and that's why I have decided that, uh, now that I'm in my retirement, that I want to help document not only the GCAP history, but LGBTQ history in general. And I will still continue. And if any of you here today are interested in helping uh, continue with that, um, please let me know. And one other little brain cell that just popped into my mind, is the new executive director here? Yeah, I think Barry's here. I think we need to introduce the new executive. Do you want to come down here and share? I, I just heard this here, a day or two. Jim's story real quick. Okay. I've got to tell this real quick. It's, it's, you want to hear another Julie story? No, it's a Joan well, story. Yeah. Well, a Joan, well, he's Joan getting, story. well, he's getting down here. So I just want to tell you that one time Joan and I were, were meeting with an agency that wanted to get funding, and they made it clear that you had to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in order to come there and get help. And Joan said, well, what if they are not Christian? He's like, oh, that's completely fine. We don't care if you're Christian. You just have to accept Lord Jesus Christ. And I was sitting there like, what? And I was new to this. And Joan was there. And I, and then she said, well, how do you feel about the, you know, the people that we deal with that have HIV AIDS, if they're going to be coming there, and this was early on, a lot of them are going to be uh, gay men. Is that uh, going to be a problem? Like, absolutely not. As long as they're not practicing homosexuals. <laughs> And I said, oh no. I said, oh no, they're not practicing homosexuals, so they're really good at it. <laughs> at which point, at which point, Joan pinched the hell out of my leg underneath the table. <laughs> so that's the difference. <laughs> I, I will let Mike introduce our uh, new executive director for GCAP, starting soon. Just a few short weeks now, so I'd like to introduce Barry Stevenson to you all. Barry. Um, this is actually the first time I've been to the board and we're doing all this behind the camera. And uh, so uh, this is a very special moment to finally meet the new executive director. So welcome. Thank you, Mike. Do you have anything you'd like to say? So, <laughs> help yourself. Like, yeah, say a few words. Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Nice to see everyone's smiling faces. Um, it's truly an honor and a privilege to be picked to serve uh, the community. Uh, it's also an honor and a privilege to be back in a place and a space where my heart has a lot of love and compassion. Um, Julie may not remember me, but I remember her through Edward Sinclair Bruner, through the East Central Illinois Gay Youth Project, and uh, Jeffrey. We used to actually, Julie and I, this was before I think Julie was an uh, administrator, I could be wrong, but we used to, it was before you were an administrator, but we used to sit on the Prevention Community Planning Group together. It's good to see Nicole. <laughs> I know we worked together a little bit uh, when I was working at um, the Chapel of St. John Divine as their administrator. And it's just good to be here and really just be amongst people who have a heart of love and care. And it's just an honor and a privilege to be here and be a part of this. And I just uh, truly am here to serve and collaborate and work together. And, serve our clients at GCAP and the community. So this is truly an honor and a privilege and just know I've always got open door policy. You need anything, however I can be of service, that's what I'm here for. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And with that, we are going to um, close our program. And actually, if anyone 
we knew that we were cramming way too much information in 90 minutes, but we thought people aren't going to come if we advertise it as two hours. Uh, so we certainly won't stay for two hours, but if there's anybody that has a question or comment that they would like to stick around for, I think, um, I know Julie has to go back to pulling up carpet. I think Julie has a new place, right? Son has a new place. Oh, that's right. Her son got a new house. And we demoed in, in 16 hours. We have completely gutted the condo. If you want it, if you want that, you want game moms. If you want it decorated, you want gay dads. <laughs> 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 we can tear our place down. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if you could hear her comment that if you want the work done, you want a gay mom, and if you want the decorating done, you want a gay dad. <laughs> so. That's the close of the official program. If people would like to stick around, again, I encourage you to view the quilt panels, um, read the biographies, and uh, we'll hang out a little bit if people have questions or comments. Well, I have a question. But, if yeah. a first time volunteer wants to get involved at GCAP or a campaign house, who do they contact? Well, I'm guessing for right now it'll be Mike <laughs> and or Barry. And if I remember right from the email that I saw Mike send me just a day or two ago, Barry is capital B-E-R-R-Y, so just like Jerry, except for the B, which reminds me, my mom used to have this pet name for me, Jerry Barry Bean Blossom. <laughs> I don't know why I put that on tape. <laughs> no, edit that out. So um, I'm sure either Barry or Mike can get you involved in, in volunteering. Anything else that we want to have on tape? And otherwise, we will tell our videographer. And thank you so much for streaming, Nicole, and um, for our videographer from Spurlock. And anything at all? Okay, thank you.